Uh, welcome back. Um, that was just some behind the scenes magic to get our next presenter ready. Um, so continuing our theme of uh, telehealth and removing barriers to accessing care, um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, John Herries, who's a group manager of emerging health technology at the Ministry of Health New Zealand. Um, he's working with the health sector, industry and researchers to bring new technology to healthcare services in New Zealand. Um, and I'm excited to have him present what's happening in this space. So welcome, John. Thank you. Kia ora, uh, nā mahi mō te tuku i a au ki te korero ko nga te ruanui te iwi nō tai rāwhiti a hau. Kei te mahi a hau i te mana tu hauora ko John Herry Staku Ingoa, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. And in the week of te reo, um, uh, hopefully that's uh, useful to people, but um, for those that don't speak, te reo, um, my name's John, I work at the Ministry of Health um, and my job is um, as the Group Manager for Emerging Health Technology and, and Innovation um, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I am going to share some slides with you um, now and hopefully we can go. So... Ron um, asked me to speak a wee while ago, and um, I have to admit, you know, off the bat, um, while I trained as a physiotherapist, um, I've not had a huge amount to do with HIV in New Zealand. And so um, it involved me going and doing a bit of research into how we manage HIV in New Zealand. So um, some of this has been a really interesting kind of journey for me. So um, hopefully this is useful, but um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing and how that might interface with some of some of what um, being talked about today. Um, I want to start just by kind of telling the story about the fact that things, uh, technology and healthcare and healthcare is seeing a lot of convergence. So things that might have previously been dealt with separately. So you might have, uh, and diabetes is my example here, things that might have been dealt with separately are now starting to come together. So how do you, how, how does that happen in a way which is useful to a consumer or to the health system as well? So you can start to see the biologic and genomic domain and the pharma domain and the hardware domain slowly becoming more digital. So um, if they become more digital, there becomes kind of lots of questions around things like trust, confidence, privacy, um, and just the amount of data that starts to come along with that. So. Um, when we start to think about technology and healthcare, often um, our, our system is really focused on creating data um, that shows us where to improve. So if you talk to lots of clinicians, they're really focused on how do we get more data so we know whether we're doing the right thing. Um, when we talk about it from a digital perspective, we think um, digital and technology has a role to play um, by improving um, uh, the design of how we deliver services and the ability to personalize them really easily through, uh, through the use of digital. We also um, think that there's a real opportunity to deliver care differently. So historically, the health system has been very, very people-centered. People um, there's a really good um, website um, that we uh, are members of, um, which is the Health Informatics New Zealand website, so HINS. And on there, there was a chat called Terry Lee, who was a rural firefighter in Australia, lost um, both his hands and got severe burns in a bushfire, um, and tells a really powerful story about um, how he's got Alexa in his house. And Alexa basically makes him independent. So she turns the shower on and off. She turns the big dryer on and off for his body. She turns the air conditioning up and down, opens doors, turns the television on and changes the channel. And for him, that's made a big difference to his life because before that, Either he relied on his wife to help him with all of those tasks or someone had to come into his house to do that for him. So we see big opportunities for technology that has not been around for very long. So Alexa didn't exist 10 years ago um, to change directly what we do as a health system. And lastly, kind of something that I know the 10 guys will have talked about quite, a, quite extensively is how do we put consumers and Fano at the center of care? So the health system historically um, has been designed around the people that deliver care rather than around the people that, um, that uh, need to stay well. And for us, that's kind of a really big driving uh, kind of factor and agenda for us in terms of the future of the health system. Um, and we think there's a, there, there are opportunities um, 
quite widely in the health system and maybe we'll talk about a little bit of that um, kind of in my talk. Um, so like I said, I did a little bit of background and um, I saw this great initiative about taking home a HIV test for free. That's genius. So um, congratulations, great idea, love it. Um, but one of the things I did see was um, the, and, and another great statistic obviously is um, the total number of HIV infections in 2020, um, the lot being the lowest since 2012. That's really great news. Um, but I did, when I started to dig into the data, um, started to see that we're still not testing um, people regularly or people aren't being tested regularly. And that number of regular uh, people who are being tested regularly is slowly going down. And we can see that through CD4 counts. So um, I think I think there's a really interesting question here. So obviously it's being tackled um, by, uh, by making testing more convenient. What else could we do? How, how do we build trust, make it more available, make it more convenient and make it, make it easier to do? At the same time, um, we also know as the Ministry of Health um, and more generally in the health system, um, taking medicines isn't actually that easy sometimes. So um, when you start to have a look at uh, the, the types of medicines that are taken either for HIV and or to prevent infection, um, people often get side effects, they interact with other medicines or um, you run into problems if you stop taking them, even if, yeah, even if you forget to take them. So, you know, it might be that you come home late at night or you're busy at work and so you just forget, forget to take your medicine. So um, it seems like in some of the some of the things that I've read that this might be a, an issue as well in, in the context of HIV. So um, those are two really interesting things because um, testing um, and, and getting the care that you need is something that we've been working on um, for the last 18 months. And to kind of talk about that in a little bit more detail and kind of what we've learned, um, I've kind of got three things on here on this slide. So the first one is kind of the communications that the government's been doing around the Unite Against COVID um, campaign and response. And the interesting thing is that um, we've got a central place you can go to get all of the information that you need. So you can go to the Unite Against COVID website. Um, lots of people know where it is. It's got a really um, well understood and known brand. Um, um, we also know that there's a testing um, uh, requirement here. Um, and so I've got a picture of a waiting line. Um, something we've learned is that people don't like to wait. Um, ironically, the health system's full of waiting rooms and waiting, waiting times. And something we've been doing is putting in place, um, and we'll relate this directly back to that testing conversation. We've put in place an e-order system. So um, an example of how that's gone live in Auckland is um, one site we put in at lunchtime. Um, and in the morning, they dealt with 73 tests. And in the afternoon, they were able to deal with 300 with the same number of people. So we went from a very paper heavy system to a very, uh, a very uh, paper non-existent system. And in that, um, obviously, that made it much more convenient for people. And so where the theory being is if you can make the lines as short as possible, the more likely people are to go and get tested. Something else that we've been talking about is how we make testing um, testing wait times and locations more available. So some of, some of you might have seen the vax.nz website, which has come up recently, which takes some of the data that we offer um, through APIs and presents that in a different way. Um, there's also the time in line, time in the line website.co.nz, which we also are using and serving information to about where testing's happening and, and we're working to give them some of the data we have out of this ordering system to be able to show people how long they might need to wait when they go and when they go and get tested. On the right-hand side is some work that um, we started last year um, uh, and kind of have continued to iterate on. Um, and there's a little bit in this, um, which um, some of you will see if you keep your diary up to date, um, which is a little swirl. Um, we've started to dip our toes into that motivation piece, that, 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 that conversation around how do you get people to regularly participate? So. Um, we've added that, we've then added weekly reminders. So if you stop scanning, or you haven't been scanning, it'll remind you after a week. We're then also working on better convenience. So how do we, um, how could we use um, something that we're about to start trialing in, in Victoria University, our NFC stickers, so um, tap and go, 
um, is kind of the common, uh, the, the common way of thinking about it or Apple Pay or Google Pay that you would do for your phone. So you, would, you wouldn't have to unlock your phone. You just tap your phone on the sticker and it checks you in a location. So you don't have to kind of figure out how far your phone away is, uh, is, is from the QR code and try and scan it. So all of that um, kind of is a focus on um, knowing, know, knowing what you need to know and then how do we try and make things as easy as convenient, a, easy and convenient as possible. The last thing that's kind of not said there, but kind of underpins all of the work that we do is how do we build trust? And, and I think uh, historically, um, particularly in the context of HIV, trust, is, trust has been a thing that's been lacking um, both from the health system's response, from the government's response uh, internationally um, for, for the community um, at risk of HIV infection. Um, and, and it's certainly something that we've learned in this, in this response is that the most important thing is that people trust us and that they feel like we're, we're, looking, after, we're looking after their best interests. And so COVID Tracer is a really good example of, of that, um, where we've done it, uh, almost everything we can um, and, and inconvenienced ourselves as much as we can in order to, to make it as, as useful um, to the person and, and, and hopefully try and build some trust in how we're doing that. Which kind of leads on to the next step, which is um, we've, we've been doing some work around um, how you move from something like COVID Tracer, which is basically completely anonymous, but try and keep that privacy and trust and then try and um, add to that kind of the services that are expected. So um, we started um, before, before the COVID pandemic looking at something called a digital identity. Digital identity and the purpose for that is um, that ability to make things as private as possible and to build trust. So the first thing we needed to do was think about authentication. So that's the username and the login and how would we do that? And so we're, we think that's pretty easy. The next thing is to, have the person identify themselves to us. So that might be provide us some information about yourself, such as your date of birth, your first name and your last name, and or maybe some identification, um, such as like a driver's license. And we think that's, that's a relatively easy thing to do online. Um, there's a really, really hard thing, um, which is verification. So how do we check that you are who you say you are um, and you haven't stolen someone's driver's license? Um, that's a hard problem to solve. Growing numbers of organizations have solved that. And so we're looking to, to leverage what other people have solved. And then the last one is authorization. So the question in that space is, what does is, what is a digital identity look like um, where I can, I can see my partner's information or I can see my parents' information? So if they need to go to the doctor, um, I can see when the appointment is, or I can help relay the information to the health professional. So that authorization between people, and given um, mo most of the care in the health system is delivered to the very young and the very old, um, it's really important for us to try and solve that problem of how do we how do we let in a in a trusted but private manner people share that information in 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 in, in, in the health system. On the right hand side. Um, you can start to see, if you think about this in the context of the medicines, so we talked a little bit about lab tests, but in the context of medicines, um, we first started thinking about records and health records, which is kind of the knowing what to do. So you might have data, but how do you go from data to knowledge? And, and it turns out that's really hard, even with standardized data. So um, there's lots of work for us to do in this space. Um, when we did some experiments with some New Zealanders um, before COVID, um, what we realized was that um, we didn't have plain language explanations of commonly prescribed medicines available to, to give to people. So of the top 100 prescribed medicines in New Zealand, we only had um, patient information leaflets is what they're called for 80 of them. We only had them in one style. We only had them in one language. So as long as you had you know, a certain reading age and you didn't want them pictorially described, you could take advantage of a patient information leaflet 80 times out of 100. On the right-hand side, you've got this convenience thing. So how, how do you not just show people what their prescription is, but how do you let them repeat their prescription? How do you help them understand whether they're taking their medicines or not? How do you help people understand what common side effects are and to report them? 
How do you under, how do you help people understand if they're about to take another medicine, whether it's going to interact with the first one? And then how do you understand what people's outcomes are? Because of course, this is kind of the reason for all of this convenience and knowing what to do is hopefully with a more informed population and one that can take a lot more control of their care, you get better outcomes. So some of this we're working on, have been working on um, in COVID, uh, particularly with the vaccine. So um, we've started to do a lot of work on the right-hand side. You would have seen the booking system for the vaccination. Um, we've automated most of the process um, around being vaccinated. And we're now doing um, automated follow-ups with people to see did they have a good experience when they were vaccinated? Did they have any side effects? And, and, and did they have any adverse outcomes? All delivered in a digital way. And what we've seen is that um, in that, lots of New Zealand is ready for that. So it's not all of New Zealand, but lots of New Zealand is ready for that. And so what we're working on is also how we, how we look after people that we need to include and enable. So um, we're not the government lead for digital inclusion, but we're doing a bunch of work in digital enablement for, for the country as well. Um, which kind of leads to the bigger picture question. So that's all very, very good, John, but you've not kind of talked about my problem or HIV in particular. And I suppose what I've tried to demonstrate is how it might come together. So some people might um, follow politics reasonably closely and or read the, the government's budget announcement. The government announced up, uh, approximately 500 million um, of investment for something which we're calling HERA. Um, uh, it's a Māori word and it means um, momentous and we think this is a big sea change for how the health system works. So um, at the moment um, there's generally some information out there that gets shared between providers um, if they're lucky um, and, but really no one else. So, so there, isn't, there aren't established channels for other people to get access to data. What HERA is is, a, is something that sits in between um, the data and the users of the data um, to focus on things like interoperability, um, architecture and standards. So how, what does the data look like and how do you make it interoperable? Security, privacy and trust, which I've just talked about. Some foundation services like a digital identity, making sure that we're not um, creating monopolies. Um, so having good commercial frameworks, but also making sure that um, we're able to innovate. And we think what that means is that opens things up. So that opens up if we can do it in a trusted and, 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 and secure way, um, the ability for the consumers to participate much more fully in the health system for innovators to build on top of these types of services. So it's not just about technology, it's more about making that technology available and making, um, making things that actually are useful to people. Um, so rather than about data, but more about, more about that convenience and more about making things more convenient. And if you then multiply that out, I was talking about medicines before, um, uh, there are lots of types of information in the health system. So from medicines to care plans, to the history of your, um, your health, to information that you capture as a person um, in the community rather than is captured by the health system, to things like um, preferences. So we don't do a good job of capturing what your preferences are as a, as a person that uses health services. So that's that's where HEAD is going. It's growing what we've talked about and what I've talked about and what we've been working on in the last 18 months. And here's a little bit of a sneak peek about kind of the first thing that's coming next. So um, we've currently got an app in beta. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about vaccine passports. Um, we tend to not use the passport word. We tend to use the the, the um, the word certificate. Um, we're working on something which is called My COVID Record. So it takes that digital identity, it connects your, your information from your vaccination and your results from your COVID testing and presents that to you in a web app. So this is a, 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 a slightly anonymized version of my own record. Um, interesting question. So now this is going to become available to all um, all the people in the country to create their accounts. And this becomes kind of the, the first part of um, that opportunity of, of, of opening up our services and our infrastructure for smart people to take advantage of. People like TEND, what, what might they do if they can get access, more access to information? What might other smart people build? What we're really keen to make sure though when we're doing this is kind of that trust um, 
and convenience piece needs to kind of underpin all of that. So if you're not doing something that makes makes it better for the consumer and you're not doing something that they can trust, we're not going to go anywhere. So as an underpinning thing for us, that's those are kind of the things that we're we're really focused on. This gives us some really good starting patterns, but you could imagine we could build an app, we could potentially get someone building an app that leverages my health account and uh, which is the identity and starts to help people that are managing PrEP or managing um, the antiretrovirals um, in a more efficient way, you know, like give me, give me a reminder at eight o'clock at night if I haven't taken my medicines today or where is the closest place I can go and get an HIV test where either people don't know me or I can, I can go and do it anonymously. Questions like this we think are really interesting and we think we're trying to build the infrastructure that enables um, all parts of the community to try and solve some of the problems that they have. So hopefully that's been a, a useful conversation. I'm more than happy to take questions on, on, on um, what people are interested to talk about um, and we can go from there. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, John. That was really informative. Um, so I think that was a, a really good presentation. Uh, thank you for all that insight. Um, the concept of being able to control your data and being able to share it with people like care teams, I think is a really important kind of uh, opportunity for people, which we haven't really thought about, so that you can have people that you trust that can help you with your health. Um, I think that's really important. I think the the privacy thing is really important as well, especially in the um, in terms of the HIV space, um, who you want to be able to see that data. Um, and that's one of the choices that people make is when they go to see certain providers, they don't necessarily want everybody to be able to see all that information. So I think having some control over that privacy and being confident in that is really an important thing as well. So I think this is some exciting uh, uh, opportunities there.